Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sankhang namasami uh, with all of the, the work and business which I have to do. I'm just uh, stopping for a short while. Short while being three months. Just stopping just to come in here and to uh, perform the, the ceremony of entering the rains. Just stopping to recall the uh, meaning and the heart of this monastic life. It's something which gives great inspiration because the whole echo of what we're doing this this evening is an echo which finds its origin in the time of the Buddha. This is a ceremony which harks back to the life of the Buddha. This is doing the, the bidding of the great teacher. This is following in his footsteps the determination to cease wandering for the next three months. And that word cessation is a word which brings great happiness to my mind. It's a word which my mind leaps towards because cessation of so many things is conducive to joy. Cessation is that which is conducive to the feeling of liberation in the heart. The freedom from the busyness, from the complication, and from the the sheer pain of the world. When the mind inclines towards the world, when it's not just inclined towards the world, when it's dragged towards the world because of our duties, either as a senior monk, or as a junior monk, as a sister, novice, sanagarika, when it's dragged towards that world where all these differences are are recognized. (coughs) And it always drags with it things like worldly dhammas, praise and blame, happiness, suffering, gain and loss, fame and abuse. All of these eight worldly dhammas live in that world. And in that world you can't avoid those worldly dhammas. In that world there's always going to be some suffering. I can never find satisfaction in that world. It is a world which, having played around in that place for long enough, if you think that that's all there is, then you'll get frustrated, disillusioned, and depressed. And sometimes people in the world experience that frustration, disillusionment, depression, and wish to even take their life. Instead of wishing them to take their life, that's not the right way. Instead, take your mind. Take the defilements. So destroy those rather than the life force. Because it's the defilements which are causing the problems. (coughs) The desire for things which will never give you satisfaction. The anger, the ill will towards that or (coughs) those people who you think stand in your way. And the deep-seated delusion of a self, and the self which imagines that such happiness and satisfaction can be found in such a, a barren desert, which we call the world. It's a barren desert because it does have no uh, life-giving happiness. It's a desert because it's empty, parched, empty of freedom and parched from rest from a place where you can lay down without being irritated by the searing heat of the sun. That this world <coughs> is a barren place and anyone who has any uh, inclination or insight towards the Dhamma will look upon the beautiful amazing Dhamma of the Buddha as an oasis in that desert. It's a place which 
you get pushed out of by the contingencies of running a monastery, or having a body, having to go to doctors, dentists, having to do visas, having to protect the sasana. All of that pushes you out of this beautiful oasis of cool, restful, delicious dhamma. But this is a time above all where we say goodbye to that desert where even I can be irresponsible and not give a a care to the teaching of lay people and to the duties of the city centre. Or I can (coughs) even let go of a lot of my duties to other monks and people in this monastery. We can just sit alone in your hut. Sit alone as I did as a young monk. Just alone without any duties and responsibilities. Alone and free from any irritations or anger or desires or business caused by the friction of living with another monk. I was reminiscing today to the visitors after the meal about one of the most delicious range retreats I had in my six year as a monk, which was in a monastery in the north of Thailand, where there was a, a deep cave in a valley up in the mountains, where I would see a car once every week for about five minutes if I bothered to look. The rest of the day, the rest of the week, there was no vehicles to be seen at all. I would only see people for about 15 minutes every day when I went over the ridge to the to the village on the other side to collect my arms food. They were <coughs> uh, northern Thais who were very happy just to feed you and didn't want anything else. They would come on the, the nights of one pra of the moon days and stay the night. But other than that, for most of the days of the week, for all that three months, for twenty three and a half hours every day, I was alone in this well set up monastery. To me that solitude was bliss. To me that solitude which meant that I had no duties nothing to say to another human being, (coughs) no business created by the proximity of another. It was so freeing. And even now as I remember those days, my mind leaps to the solitude which that created. These days I find myself as a busy abbot in a big monastery. But still, I know that that type of monastery which I spent my six reigns is still to be found here in Bodhnyana. That cave where I used to spend many happy hours meditating exists right inside my mind. The cave of the heart. That cave of the heart is a metaphor which the Lord Buddha used. And for anyone who knows any degree of deep meditation, you can recognize that metaphor as a a beautiful description of the mind which becomes secluded from the world by going deep within. That seclusion from the world by going deep within is why we have this range retreat. If you want to have more experiences of the world outside, this is the wrong place to be. If you want to have experiences of the mind, then welcome to this retreat. Because by going inside, by going into this cave, as in many caves, there was buried beautiful treasures, putting them in there because they could be preserved and they're not wasted by the human beings who do not need, do not realize the value of treasures and can misplace them, throw them away, dissipate them heedlessly. In that deep cave of the mind, the Buddha buried a 
or not buried, but found a deep treasure, a profound treasure, the most valuable treasure. That treasure is called liberation, freedom, ease, endless suffering. That's where this treasure can be found, not out there in the world, but deep within. And so we (coughs) have built all these facilities. We've created all this support. We have established these traditions. And please know that all of this work, traditions, teaching, is all pointing, meaning, directing towards this one thing, to Nibbāna, the end of suffering, the cessation of all this, the true liberation from the realm of samsara. This whole monastery has just that one aim, that one peak. And I struggle very hard to try and keep this monastery aimed. It's like being a captain of a ship, so trying to hold the rudder against many different currents and very strong winds, which is always trying to blow this this monastery off course. And it's a struggle to keep the ship directed. But it's directed good enough. And if you wish to help to move in that same direction, I've noticed over the years <laughs> that when a group of meditators, no matter what gender, no matter what status, if they move in the right direction, in the same direction, in the direction of calming the defilement, stopping the thinking mind, avoiding papancha, calming the mind, going to those peaceful states, you find that when one monk, one anagarika, one whoever, when one has a very deep meditation that night, that afternoon, Many other meditators here also experience a deepening of their samadhi. They also experience a widening of their insight. It it is if that there is some (coughs) sort of uh, connection, there is some sort of energy, there is some sort of movement which each one of us can pick up on. And if one person goes in the opposite direction, if one person goes to more worldliness, more desire, more anger, more irritation, if a person gives in to their gross defilements, again, others feel it. And it pulls and holds back the whole monastery, the whole community. It's like somebody swimming in the water. They create a current, they create a flow of water, and those swimming alongside get pulled along in its wake. In the same way that those who are really good meditators in this monastery, thank you for being here, because you're going to help everybody deepen their meditation. (coughs) And every meditation which you do, which (coughs) which is deep, powerful, sublime, know that that's going to be felt. Its energy is going to spread beyond your hut and can pull everyone else along. And it's my hope, it's my intention that people who are practicing in this monastery during this rains retreat, who are using the facilities here, can remember why they're built, why the food is offered here, why the facilities are in place. The facilities are here for just this one reason, to deepen the experience of freedom. And because that you can remember and recall that that is our main purpose, everything should be subservient to that one goal, to that one purpose. If you wish to read, fine, as long as it's going to help the meditation. If you wish to study, fine, as long as it's going to be helping the meditation. But make sure the meditation is your main goal, your main aim. (coughs) I know many of you have been working hard 
have been sacrificing much of your time just to be here and to have this opportunity. And unfortunately, I have seen in past retreats, people put forth that energy and strive and put in the hours for the first week or two, and then slacken off, not being able to last the pace. And when the end of the range retreat comes, they haven't got much to show for this three months of silence and solitude. And they say, well, maybe next range retreat. <coughs> I'm sure Ajahn Yana knows that I often laugh when people come and tell me how their retreat was. At least I'm talking about the two-week retreats we do here. So often, it happens so often that it makes me laugh with some sadness. When they say after the two weeks, yes, I was just getting into it. And then the two weeks were gone. Just get into it on the first day. And then the second, the third, and fourth, fifth days will be beautiful. Don't wait till the end of the range retreat to start. Don't wait till the next range retreat to start. Now is the only time you have. Be diligent. And every time you experience, as you will do, any degree of peace in your meditation, spend time to loiter in that silence, in that peacefulness, in that happiness, in that joy. Don't just sit there getting deeper and deeper and then as soon as the hour is up or 50 minutes or the two hours or whatever, just get up without contemplating what you're experiencing. <coughs> By contemplating what you're experiencing, I'm basically saying to condition yourself to notice to appreciate and to incline towards the beautiful peace, contentment and freedom of samadhi. See if you can learn to be attached to that samadhi. I guarantee it's much better to be attached to the blisses of samadhi than it is to be attached to your thinking mind, to your tea, coffee, to your food, to your books, or whatever else which you spend a lot of time wasting. See if you can be attached to the silence of the mind. And you attach the silence of the mind by conditioning your mind to recognize these states as delightful, enjoyable, far more superior than anything which thought can describe to you. Far more <laughs> enjoyable than anything which the world can offer to you in activity through the senses. Just getting a taste of those beautiful freedoms of the mind is all you really need. Because that's going to inform you that there is a, a greater peace, a greater happiness, a joy which surpasses the world. Basically, theory and ideas are never good enough. Just through theories and ideas, people argue about what the Buddha really meant. What's the vinya and what's not the vinya? What's dhamma, what's not dhamma? Is jhana necessary for stream winning or is it not necessary for stream winning? Basically, I'm only listening to someone who's attained to be a stream winner or has got jhana. Perhaps they won't know. And their words and ideas on that question have a bit more meaning. Experience is so much more important than thoughts and theories. So you have this opportunity during this range retreat to put the Dhamma which you've read in the books into practice, experience these states for yourself, so that you will know, not just through your analytical knowledge of Pali and Sutta and Vinaya, and what this monk says and what that teacher says, but you'll know through your direct experience, through the only criteria which truly matters, to experience 
which is interpreted in the framework of the Buddha's teachings. When you experience these states, it's as if the teachings and the suttas and the vinyas become incandescent. I won't say they just glow, they become brilliant. They become so bright. Only then can you truly understand those teachings. You can truly appreciate their depth, their profundity, their accuracy, their truth. (coughs) But not before. It's a common (coughs) um, idea that to be a stream winner, all you need to do is to understand the Four Noble Truths. Right view. But how many people know those Four Noble Truths? Can recite them and understand them, but aren't stream winners? Who cannot say to another monk that I am a Sotapanna? Because for a monk saying that, when they're not absolutely sure, is going to create so much doubt in their mind that they are close to the disrobing offence of Parajika. And they don't say that unless they have absolute surety. (coughs) And so, at least with monks, they don't just go around saying these things lightly. Apparently in the world that anyone says these things because there's no recourse. They can say them lightly without needing to make sure that what they're saying is correct and truthful. But the point I'm making is that the experience of this Dhamma, the experience which is described by the Buddha, is what is important. The simile which I've mentioned before is like the guidebook to Paris. I like this simile because actually I've never been to Paris. But I know that there's something there called the Arc de Triomphe and Notre Dame and (coughs) the Eiffel Tower. But that's all I know, theory. I don't know as much about Paris, nowhere near as much about Paris, as someone who's been there, who spent many months there, who's wandered around the place and actually felt and smelled that city. In the same way, you cannot know about these (coughs) deep states of meditation, these powerful insights, just through the guidebooks. You do need that experience. You do need to smell and taste and feel jhanas, as it were. I mentioned the five senses are completely gone in that state. This is just a metaphor. (coughs) You do need to understand these magapalas to experience. So you have all the framework there, but don't think you can get further by just analysing the framework. Go to some experience to be able to, in this moment, let go of the defilements, let go of the five hindrances. In this moment, make the mind peaceful, clear, calm, and see what it's like. See if you can get to that Dhamma which is beyond thought, which is beyond words, beyond ideas. Get to that (coughs) place which the words are trying to point towards. That's where you're supposed to be going, that's the purpose of words. Not just to correct the spelling, but to see where these things are pointing to. And these words of the Buddha are pointing to a very beautiful place. I mention it's a beautiful place because if Nibbāna was not the ultimate happiness, then no one would be able to reach it. Because Nibbāna is the ultimate happiness, because the insights which liberate you, liberate you from suffering, because the jhanas are ecstasies, because of those things, they become possible for the human mind to enter. Follow a path of increasing happiness. You will not be able to will yourself into these states. The will is a function of the ego. 
the illusion of self. That will which is coming from that illusion will never be able to take you to this goal. Instead, use the inclination of the mind to seek freedom, to seek contentment, to seek happiness. To test out (coughs) in your meditation, in your life as a monastic, to test out the times when you felt the most comfort, freedom, contentment, profundity, bliss. And go there again. And next time go deeper. As you go deeper to feel what that state is like. To test its profundity, its depth, its measure of bliss. And ask why. Why are these meditations so delightful? Use the insight into the path of happiness and peace. Because in a very deep level what that's doing is conditioning your mind to go there again. Wherever you find happiness, the mind will incline towards that place again. You're replacing will, a decision based on thoughts and fancies and ideas and proliferations, because that's usually what controls your mind. That's what makes you do these things, follow those trains of thoughts, write those letters. (coughs) Instead of using that, see if you can be motivated The mind can be directed and run by the inclination to the liberated states of mind. Each one of you here has meditated enough to have some sort of taste of liberation. Even if it's only a small liberation from the course of defilements, even that always has this this beautiful freedom as its uh, essence as its (coughs) flavour, even though that, even though that the the beautiful scent is only in a very, very small quantity, it still goes a long, long way. Just the smell of a flower, apparently the molecules, I think was it phenomes or something, there's only just a couple of molecules is all that was needed for the nose to be able to smell the scent of a flower a long way away. That's how bees can find the flowers from great distances. In the same way, you don't need many molecules, as it were, of freedom to be able to sense that there is a beautiful flower. The fragrance which you begin to smell in your meditation is coming from the flower of Nibbana. The scent is still very weak because it's covered up by the other pongs of defilements, the stench of craving. But still underneath that stench, the suffering of life, the difficulty, the agitation, the irritation of existence, thinking, being, (coughs) underneath that or in it, somewhere around, I can always smell that there's something which is refined, which is beautiful, which is attractive, which is pure. It's the fragrance of Nibbana. Follow your nose in this metaphor. Follow that fragrance and see if by letting go of the world, by spending time by yourself, by developing the cave inside the mind, by developing solitude, by developing peacefulness, by developing stopping, (coughs) non-proliferation. See if that fragrance increases. Wherever that fragrance increases, just follow it. Incline the mind to the fragrance of release. And that will lead you much more surely than your ideas and your will. That will lead you to liberation. It will lead you through the jhanas, it will lead you through Magapala, it will lead you to Nibbana. Nibbana paramangs who come. Nibbana is the source of that fragrance. And it's here in this monastery. It's there to be followed. And so as you sit, as you walk, as you guard the mind, from excessive thought, from proliferations, 
as you guard the mind from wandering into the past and the future and keep it centered in the present moment. You can taste, smell that fragrance and you know when that fragrance is there and you know when it's gone. When you're angry, when you're irritated, when you're upset at somebody or something, when you're tired, when you're lazy, when the (coughs) craving is there very strong to do something else, go somewhere else, be something else, when that craving is taking you away from your center and you know that fragrance is absent, it's not there, there's nothing which is inspiring, which is uh, warming the mind, there's nothing which is comforting the heart. You feel lost, you feel hungry, there's nothing there. No, it's because the defilements have taken you in the opposite direction, away from the fragrance of Nibbana. Every time you sit on your cushion and close your eyes, smell that fragrance and go towards it, allow the mind to follow it. The fragrance of Nibbana, the fragrance of renunciation, the fragrance of letting go, the fragrance of not following the self, but seeing that that is just a phantom covering something just so much more beautiful. Follow that which is more beautiful, the source of the scent. (coughs) And that will always lead you to the increasing fragrance, the increasing happiness, the increasing pity sukha, the increasing equanimity, the increasing liberation of freedom, which is our goal. The Buddha said this is a gradual path, just like the sea gets deeper and deeper gradually. The fragrance gets deeper and more profound, more all-embracing, the further you go. It's as if you could get so far, then the fragrance becomes so strong that it pulls you to Nibbana. It pulls you irresistibly into itself into cessation, into liberation. It's just getting that first few miles along the path, that first short distance, until the nose can really smell that there's something beautiful there, something wonderful, something you've been searching for, meaning of life, the liberation of the heart, whatever you wish to call it. That something is recognized by some sense or whatever. And that is what is to be followed. That is what is to be indulged in. <coughs> that is what will give you the happiness of this retreat. And if you follow that, notice it, recognize it, follow it, I will guarantee it will grow and grow and grow. Because this is a nature of things. It's nothing to do with you, with me, with anybody else. This is a nature of the mind seeking its own liberation seeking its freedom. The whole point of the mind, its whole reason, function to exist, is to seek freedom, to seek comfort, to seek rest, stillness, to seek stopping. Isn't that why we want things? We want things so we don't want any more. We want to get rid of these things, gain them, so that once we're there, then we can truly rest. The whole purpose of desire is to eradicate desire. We think, once I get this, then I won't need anything again. The desire based on the sensory world is uncertain, insubstantial, doesn't last, subject to change, unreliable. That's why there's no rest in that world. You know, actually, stupid monk that I was, I thought when I was a young monk coming to this monastery, we could build this monastery in five years, set it up, and it would be okay, and I could rest. (coughs) I thought, stupid monk as I was, I just set everything up here, and I wouldn't need to do any more, then I could rest. There's no rest in the world. 
even if you have a billion dollars and get the best monastery, and instead of having Anagara, because we have butlers, a butler for every monk, a butler even for the novice, for the nun, for the Anagarikas, even for the, the people who just come here for three months, even for one month, Nicholas, we have a butler <coughs> paid for by the Buddhist Society of Western Australia to bring the food you like, you have a room service button in your kuti in your room, and just press for the butler, and he'll come and give you whatever you want, and even give you a foot massage three times a day, and a newspaper after your meditation. Whatever it is, no matter how much that you, you do to make this monastery comfortable, a toilet in each hut, a jacuzzi in the back, electricity, hot and cold running water, it will never be finished. There will always be something more, something else. There's just no rest in that world. You see some monasteries where they pump so much money into making the, the monastery just so perfect. It's never good enough. It never can be good enough. <coughs> the world is of its nature unsatisfying, irritating, always giving more business, not less. You never actually get things done in this monastery. You just make more work. In the mind, you can get things done. You can make less work inside, not outside. This monastery will always be incomplete. There will always be work on my desk and other people's desk as well. Never will my desk be empty. A desk outside, that is. But a desk inside, very easy to make it empty. I empty of everything which has happened. From a moment ago, right to the time I was born, previous lives a lot. Empty. I empty it of all ideas, <coughs> proliferations, expectations, in anticipation, all fantasies about the future, because all future things are just fantasies, that's all. I haven't got a clue what will happen tomorrow. I haven't got a clue what I'm going to say in the next moment in this talk. It's just coming out by itself. All of this, you let go of. And when you liberate yourself in the present moment, you get that fragrance of Nibbana. That's why the, the present moment calls you. Leads inwards. Ehi pasiko. Come in, said the present moment. It's very inviting and very beautiful in there. Come in, says silence. Ehi pasiko, ehi bhikkhu, ehi samanera, ehi siladara, ehi anagarika, anagarika. Come in, shouts silence. Come in, shouts jhanas. Come in, shouts magapala. If you follow that fragrance, it will lead you inwards. (laughs) It will lead you inwards to the emptiness of the mind to the oasis in the desert, to the flower of Nibbāna, the ultimate happiness, just the beautiful triple gem of the Buddha, the gem, the valuable jewel, that which is the only thing of true worth in this world. What else is worth anything in this world? What else can ever give you happiness, can give you peace, can give you freedom, liberation? Isn't that the promise of worldly wealth? That once you have worldly wealth, so the promise goes, you can be happy, you can be free, you can do whatever you want, you're not confined. But the worldly wealth just confines you. It's a burden. (laughs) It's like many chains you have to carry around with you. Many duties and responsibilities come with worldly wealth. With spiritual wealth comes freedom. The inner (laughs) space... The inner territory where there's no boundaries at all. That's why the four Brahma Viharas are called boundless liberations of the mind. That's why I started calling the Arupa jhanas. Not just infinite space, but boundless space. Not infinite consciousness, but boundless consciousness. And I prefer that rendering because that's much closer to the truth. Like consciousness with no bounds. 
with no descriptions, binding it, bounding it, keeping it in. Just consciousness, completely unbound, boundless consciousness. We're going beyond bounds, unbinding, untying the mind. This is like the freedom inside, where there are no walls and fences and gates to go through. It's complete emptiness, liberation, freedom from the, for <coughs> from the irritation and oppression of thoughts. That's what thoughts are and ideas are. They oppress you. They always carry with it just the next thing you have to think. They carry a duty and responsibility. It's just like one of those... Uh, Reports after a meeting, which are given out these days. After you have a report at the meeting, you've got action. Ajahn Brahm has to do this. Manu Sajjata has to do that. Someone else has to do something else. All the thoughts are like that. They carry this action, which you have to do afterwards. He's wrong. Action, me. I have to tell him. This is not good enough. Action. I've got to sort it out. This is an interesting thought. Action. I've got to write this down. There's all these thoughts, they have actions. It just creates more work, more busyness, less freedom. And you're just under the tyrant of doing, the tyrant of business. There's no greater torturer than thinking. I don't know about your thinking. My thinking has got me into a lot of trouble many times. And I thought I was doing well. I thought this was, was, was wise, interesting. Amazing. Just gets you into trouble. And I don't think, in silence, there's no trouble at all. I never put my foot in my mouth, no one criticizes me, <coughs> no one praises me. Praise is even worse trouble than criticism, believe you me. Criticism is far safer, but when people start praising you, then you really just got to start being worried. Silence in the mind is much better. The silence of freedom from praise and blame. The silence of freedom from all these worldly things. And in that freedom, you have this beautiful fragrance, the taste of liberation. And it's there for you for this three months range retreat. It's very easy to do, easy to gain, easy to get to. Have confidence that you can do it. You've come close many times. This time it's going to be it. Just stop. Your biggest problem is thinking. That's why, having seen that in so many meditators over the years, I just developed these basic steps in meditation. Present moment awareness, first of all. Silence. Those are two powerful and deep methods of meditation. Don't ignore them and think, I'm much more sophisticated than this, I'm just going to go straight on to the breath. <coughs> Don't ignore these things. Why is it your meditation isn't as deep as it could be, as it should be, as it has been? No silence, and wandering off into past and future, or into fantasy world. That's why. I mentioned before that I remember some people on the retreats I've given spent so much time on the fundamentals of meditation, present moment awareness and silence. They spent so much time on that before they even started watching the breath. But when they did start to watch the breath, they got very deep meditation very, very quickly. And they soon overtook those meditators who were just ran through the preliminaries and then just gone straight on to the breath. <coughs> if you're meditating on the breath and you cannot hold that meditation, if it's uncomfortable, if it doesn't lead to, to bliss, to enjoyable breath, it's because you haven't done the fundamental foundation work. Go back. Present moment awareness. Just stay right here, right now. Silence. Stop this thinking mind. Keep it focused in silent awareness of now. 
then bring up the breath. And then when you bring up the breath in silence, focus in the present, the breath is the most delightful thing. It's a sign you have silence. It has a sign you've got present moment awareness. The breath appears to be peaceful, to be joyful, and it's just so easy to follow. Breath going in, breath going out. Happy as a lark, just watching the breath. Then the mind will just go off by itself into the breath. We'll go off into the bliss. We'll go off into the nimitta. We'll go off into the jhanas. We'll go off into nibbana. We'll cease. This is what we're going to be doing. Just follow that scent. Don't go thinking, I will follow the scent. Just allow the mind to recognize it and the mind will do it by itself. So much of the problem in meditation is people doing it, not allowing it to happen. You controlling rather than allowing the process just to go its own way. (coughs) Remember, anatta means no self. The problem of the illusion of self is the cause for all craving, aversion or upadana. The illusion of self is a problem. So how can the illusion of self manifested as your ego directing all of this, saying this is what I should be doing, this is what I shouldn't be doing, (coughs) forcing the mind, guiding the mind, driving the mind, how can that ever lead to Nibbāna? You have to get beyond your illusion, your idea of you. And with it, the doing, which comes from that illusion. Stop. Cease. And just let the mind follow the scent. When you let go, get out of the way. It's amazing. It's wonderful. So easy. So obvious. The mind just follows its own bliss. And these states of jhana, which you've heard and read so much about, are there. Stream winning, once returning, non returning. Arahat, it's just there. Following the footprints of the Buddha. Letting go. So that's a little talk for this beginning of the range retreat. Get in there, allow it to happen, but please don't do it. Okay. If you don't mind, for once, I'm not going to ask for questions after this talk. Thank uh-huh.